This is the Laura Haddad Lectureship. Laura was a native of the uh, DC area, went to Massachusetts uh, for school, and then went to, to Chicago for her medical education. She came back and was an endocrinologist uh, uh, I, uh, as, uh, at Hopkins. And unfortunately, uh, she died very early in her career on Labor Day weekend in 1989. Uh, the, her family and friends uh, had endowed this lectureship as a, an appropriate memorial for a young female physician. And we've continued this since uh, 1992. So this is my 13th uh, Haddad lectureship. One of the things that we always wanted to stress was Laura's ability as a female physician to be a humanistic and well-rounded physician. And so most of the time when I have a chance to select the uh, Haddad lectureship, I try to fit a pick a woman who has especially been instrumental in uh, advancing women in medicine. And today I'm happy to introduce to you Shelley Hall. She is the Chief of Transplant Cardiology and Mechanical Support at Baylor. Uh, Shelley, as you will be able to tell perhaps from her accent, grew up in the Northeast, but then moved to Texas and practiced her Southern drawl for many years at UT Southwestern. Uh, she did her medicine training there, her residency training and her fellowship. Um, I, I have, as we talked about earlier, Shelley is a diehard Cowboys fan. And I had to mention that for full disclosure. I first heard about her when she was very much interested in trying to get hepatitis C donors available for heart transplants. Uh, and so our paths kind of crossed in that way. And she's also, I know, as I mentioned with the Haddad lectureship, very instrumental in promoting women in cardiology. I've had some personal experience, uh, experiences with her trying to keep women advanced in, in the field of cardiology. With that introduction, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Dr. Hall, who's going to talk uh, today for the Haddad Lectureship. Shelley, welcome very much, and thank you for uh, joining us today. Thank you for having me. That was very kind. Um, so <laughs> big, big topic, short amount of time. We're going to keep this at the 10,000-foot view. Um, hopefully get some good questions and enough of a teaser to have you invite me back again, maybe in person in the future. So uh, these are my disclosures. I consult for a lot of different areas in MCS and transplant. Um, I think that partnering with the industry helps us stay aligned instead of in opposition. So I do a lot of work in trying to advance these fields. So as I said, big topics, gonna to briefly go over acute decompensated heart failure and really focus on when to refer for advanced therapies. Gonna summarize all the toys we now have for decompensated heart failure, and then give you a little insight into um, why we stress referring for transplant so early because of the process of what an evaluation takes. So first going through acute heart failure. So what still fascinates me to this very day is how little we appreciate the mortality of advanced heart failure. We have no problem sending an HIV patient to, a, to an uh, HIV physician. We have no problem sending a cancer patient to an oncologist. But for some reason, there's this big hurdle to send heart failure patients to an, a heart failure specialist. I know when I came out of training, um, the, my colleagues, the partners who hired me said, why do we need a heart failure specialist? I mean, that was my partner's first response when they found that I was going to be hired. So even in cardiology, all the way through medicine, there's just this concept that everybody can manage heart failure. And yet they have a 25% annual um, mortality rate. Um, so it, it's, it, it's still a huge problem. Um, now, part of that is this slide you've seen everywhere, and I think it's a beautiful depiction of a heart failure patient's course, is when they have the first dip where they have really what's the, the onset of symptoms and their diagnosis is made, most of the time you can stabilize them and they get to some new normal that's their life. But the reality is the rest of their life is going to be accented by episodes, decompensation episodes. And the problem with that is each return to their normal again is usually not as good as it was before. So there's this gradual, almost imperceptible decline that people fail to recognize. And it's only when they're near the end, when organs are failing and they're on all these support that somebody goes, oh, 
maybe we should be thinking about advanced therapies. And the problem with that mentality is sometimes this is their course. And I love this quote, and, and I show it often um, by Dr. Lin, the week we die will start out like any other and something will occur. Amongst those with heart failure, we have a 50-50 chance to live for six months on the day before we died. And that is the problem. If we wait for some magical sign to say, now is the time to refer them for transplant or VAD, we're gonna miss the boat. It's kind of like that parable where somebody is drowning and they, they go, God save me. And a rowboat comes by and says, get in. They're like, no, no, God's gonna save me. And then the Coast Guard comes by, get in, get in. No, no, God's gonna save me. And then he drowns and he goes to the pearly gates and goes, well, you know, I pray to you, you're supposed to save me. He goes, I sent you the boats. Um, that's our problem in heart failure. And so we have to be prepared to have early good conversations with our patients about advanced heart failure and what is their potential future. And so if we're looking for those rowboats and those coast guards, this is the list. If you remember nothing else, these are your predictors that these are the times when you should be referring a patient for an evaluation for advanced therapies. Repetitive hospitalizations defined as two or more in a year, progressive deterioration of renal function, weight loss without an other obvious cause. You're having to back off on their GDMT because they can't tolerate it anymore, whether it be symptomatic hypotension, not a number. I don't care if their blood pressure is 85. If they feel great, keep them on the medicine. It's when they are symptomatic or worsening kidney function. Um, they can't do their ADLs. And you have to ask them. You can't just in the office say, how are you doing? Patients are like teenage boys. They want to please you. So if you say, how are you? They say, fine. What you've got to do is say, can you make your bed without stopping? When you take a shower and get out, can you dry your hair without resting? Very specific questions. They first think you put cameras in their house and they're like, how did you know? But if you get very specific, if you know your patient, you know their lifestyle, you ask very specific questions. Can you go up the, that flight of stairs outside the office here? Those kind of things, you can unmask that they really can't do their ADLs. Inability to walk a block, escalation of diuretics or having to add second diuretics, hyponatremia or frequent ICD shocks, and failure to improve with BIV um, synchronization. These are all of your warning signs. These are all your rowboats that are telling you it's time to get an advanced evaluation. So what are our treatment options? This is it. This is what we've had except for, um, we've had this for 20 years. It hasn't changed. Um, it's just a matter of how we apply them to the patients. And so what I would say is that the patients referred for all of these things have the exact same heart disease, advanced heart failure. It's the everything else about the patient that determines what they're a candidate for. And that is what a heart failure person does, is evaluate them for what they can rule in or rule out as treatment options for the patient. So when we're treating a patient, particularly the ones that you see in the hospital, we've got two goals. We want to protect their end organs, so we want to recover perfusion, and we want to unload the heart. We want to protect whatever myocytes are left to function so that they can continue to function. Now, we have a definition for cardiogenic shock, but it's been inadequate for us to advance the science. So the reality is this, this in the red, in the middle, the systemic hyperperfusion, secondary to inadequate cardiac output, despite adequate volume, so blood loss is not, um, cardiogenic shock, and adequate LV filling pressure. So you have to have enough volume for the ventricle and, and so that it's purely the heart's fault. And because we've tried to do trials and, and study this, we put numbers to it. And you can see them there. But the problem is these numbers are very arbitrary and it depends upon the etiology. So because of this, we've learned that not all cardiogenic shock is the same. And this has been the detriment to our understanding of what to do, when to do it, how to do it. And so this is why these patients get sent for advanced therapies, but it's too late. So part of the problem here is that the etiology is quite varied. While predominantly 75% is LV failure, there's a whole collection of other etiologies. And then in LV failure itself, there's STEMI, there's acute on chronic, there's myocarditis. There are so many different etiologies that factor into 
what are the treatment options and what are the next step options after you stabilize. In addition, the acuity matters. So you get a normal heart that suddenly includes an LAD, that has very little ability to adapt. Whereas an acute on chronic situation has been living as what we call walking anaerobes for a long time. And their blood pressure could be normally 80 and their creatinine could be normally 1.7. And so those numbers don't have the same um, impact in prognosis. So because of this varied approach, we have not had really any advancement in study design or trials. The few things we do know about this patient population is that utilization of a swan improves survival. So getting the hemodynamics and, and understanding what those hemodynamics are tells you what ventricles are involved, the severity, and guides in your intervention. And so we did a real detriment in, the, in about 20 years ago when we did the escape trial and we put all of this, oh, swans are bad, swans kill people. And the reality is, is shock kills people, not swans. And you need a swan to guide how you manage these patients. So going into the treatment aspect of this disease, this is the fun part of a very sick disease. We have a whole bunch of toys to play with in this field. And this just kind of gives you pictorials of all that we have available. And maybe this is why we let the patients get this far because we wanna play with these toys. So right ventricle, we have two isolated percutaneous devices. The left ventricle, we have several. And then for both ventricles, we have options. Due to time, each of these could be their own lecture. I'm giving you a big overview just so you know the pros and cons of each. So I'm skipping the right-sided ones just for sake of time um, because that is a small aspect of shock, but understand there are those two percutaneous right supports. Balloon pump, pros, everybody knows what a balloon pump is. You can't get through training without having seen a balloon pump. They're everywhere, almost every ICU is gonna have one. Every cardiologist has been trained in how to put one in. Um, they're small sizes, so there's less vascular compromise. You have a variation of lengths and balloon sizes, so it can accommodate patient sizes. Essentially what it's gonna do is it's best for diastolic coronary perfusion. So it's best to try and increase coronary perfusion, and it does have some reduction in LV afterload. This is beneficial, as we talked about, for that um, decreasing myocardial um, demand. The problem is it doesn't really augment cardiac output very well, only up to about a half a liter. So true shock, balloon pumps a little bit of a challenge. You can do it bedside. Literally, I can hold it over the patient, go, okay, I need to put it in this high. This is about where I think his arch is. And then you, you advance it up and you can check a chest x-ray. So you don't need fluoroscopy and, and more advanced imaging in emergent situations. And it's cheap. Of all the left-sided support devices, it's probably the cheapest, which our CFOs love. The problem again on the con side, minimal cardiac output. You've got it, and it's best when the LV has contractility. So these are best in acute ischemic situations where your LV still has some function and you're gonna do an intervention quickly to try and improve that contractility anymore. Those amoeboid ventricles that look like you, you look at them on echo and go, how is that person alive? Intraorder balloon pump's not so great there. You can't use with severe AI. You need a relatively regular and a relatively not super fast heart rate for it to be effective. So your AFib at 170 is going to struggle. Um, and then the usual mechanical problems that can happen with a balloon pump. Tandem heart. Now this is an external pump uh, put in percutaneously. This requires two axes. Um, the first is that you have an inflow cannula that's put into the femoral vein, advanced up through the right atrium, then does a transeptal atrial puncture into the left atrium. It pulls blood out of the left atrium, empties it into the external pump, and then that dumps it back into a second access site in the femoral artery. So you get blood uh, dumped into the distal aorta uh, circulation. It has excellent cardiac output. Of course, when you've got something external, you can create a lot of flow. It unloads the left atrium very actively. You're pulling all of that blood flow out of the left atrium, so and you can get great flows. The nice thing about this device is you can use this in small LV conditions. So if you've got hypertrophs, amyloid, other infiltratives, 
you don't have to get into the LV. You don't need space in the LV. So it's good in those kind of patients. And it doesn't matter what the rhythm is because it's not gating to anything. The cons is that transeptal puncture. That requires a lot of expertise, requires um, fluoroimaging, time. Most places aren't set up to do that 24 seven in an emergency. You can only access really the leg Yes, there have been anecdotal access in other areas of the body, not with great outcomes, not recommended. As you know, whatever FDA says approved on something, we've done it every other way plus. Um, so really the leg is the recommended method. You can't use if there's clot in the left atrium. And that goes with all these kind of pumps. Don't want to suck clot up. The impella family, what we call our transaortic valvular pumps, um, is a broad spectrum of, of uh, pumps, and these are labeled, their names are based upon the flow they give. So 2.5 is two and a half liters, CP is three and a half to four, five, five and a half liters, et cetera. The, the nice thing about this is the smaller sizes are percutaneous, and the larger sizes still require a vascular cut down. But probably the best thing about this device is it's creating flow the way Mother Nature intended. It's pulling blood out of the left ventricle, through its pump and dumping it into the ascending aorta. So it's going uh, anterograde the way we want things to go. Um, it's actively unloading the left ventricle, so that's going to be the most benefit to the LV. Um, antegrade, as I mentioned, most of the time, especially for the larger flows, we're putting them in axillary with a graft cut down so that we can allow mobility. Patients can walk on a treadmill, bike, et cetera, with these in their axillary um, arteries. It's a single axis site, so just the arterial, no venous, and it doesn't matter what the rhythm is. The cons. You can't use with severe AI or can't go across a mechanical aortic valve. Um, if you've got a small LV problem, this can be a challenge. This can be a challenge in your acute MIs because that ventricle hasn't remodeled. So it can be small and then you're trying to put an impella in there and there's not enough room and you start getting suctioning or get it entangled in, in trabeculations. Again, no LV clot. Um, and the larger size, we still need the cut down. You know, we cardiologists, we're always trying to find ways to eliminate the surgeon. And we've done that in so many other areas of cardiology. And we keep begging for a five liter pump that doesn't require a surgeon. Um, and then you do need fluoro. Can you do this with imaging? Yes. Is it advised? No. And in the OR, when we put in the five O's or the five fives now, we use both TE and fluoro to optimize placement. ECMO, of course, has had a big resurgence. It's exciting. Um, the surgeons love it because it's their world. ECMO is simply taking cardiopulmonary bypass out of the OR to the bedside, okay? And I think that's important to understand because cardiopulmonary bypass is not recommended for human physiology for more than six hours. And there are a lot of reasons for that. There's a lot of hematologic things that happen, cytokine responses, um, but ultimately it's also because it's not helping the heart. So you need two cannulations, but you can add oxygen to this. So that's a big plus. So excellent flows. I mean, you, you got to remember when you're in the OR and they're doing bypass surgery or valve surgery or whatever, you're completely supporting the body. That's what ECMO was designed to do. And if you need to, you add oxygen. So if, if you've got a condition where there's bad lungs, you have that. You're going to pull blood out of the body, circulate it, oxygenate it, and dump it back. You can do this bedside. We do eCPR all the time. Again, you hold the cannulas over the body. You go, okay, I want the right atrium should be about here. This is the marker I want to, to go and you advance the catheters. Um, you can even dialyze off the circuit. So many of these patients end up needing dialysis. So that's another benefit, although there's debate on whether to do that or not from an infection risk. However, this, this modality increases LV afterload. Remember, it was designed to support the body while the surgeons fixed the heart, and then you came off bypass with a fixed heart. In this situation, you're not fixing the heart. So the longer they're left on ECMO, the more you're pounding that bad LV with a high afterload because you've got flow going retrograde up the aorta. The cannulas are large, and so distal perfusion protection should be standard of care. Lots of ischemic limbs with this, especially in eCPR when you're in a rush. So high complication rates, and about 50% of the time, you need to unload the ventricle with something. And so you need a lot of ICU expertise. However, this is popular because the surgeons love it, and it's relatively cheap. Because you need venting with ECMO about 50% of the time, 
you're going to vent by either fixing the heart with some methodology, revascularization, or you're going to see if they're inotrope responsive, which will eject, that's great, but it's going to increase your LV myocardial oxygen consumption even further, or you're going to need to unload the ventricle. And so that's where the term ECPELA came about, where an impella is placed into the left ventricle to unload the left ventricle to basically counteract the high afterload from the ECMO. The pros is some great flows as a result of the two devices together, and there's data coming out that outcomes are superior. However, more devices, more cost, and more potential for complications. So your CFOs don't like you and your quality met, uh, people don't like you. Um, but if your patient's alive, they're really gonna like you. Bivads is another option where each device is particular to the ventricle. So say you had a STEMI and you needed an impella and then uh, for, uh, in the LV and then over time the RV went down and you had to support the RV. This is a lot of times where you get two devices um, supporting one for each ventricle. The nice thing about this is you can direct your support, both insertion and weanability. And that can be very, very important. But again, more devices, more cost, more complication potentials, more expertise. And what is the durability of these? Remember, these are all, everything I just mentioned are considered temporary. I don't even know if the word temporary exists anymore in our vernacular because these have been in patients now for days to weeks to months. So I'm almost moving towards intermediate support now rather than temporary support. Most of these devices are approved by the FDA anywhere from six hours to 30 days. It's not like we pull them out when the FDA label disappears, right? So that we are continuing to push the envelope on how long we support patients on this. I think this is a great um, pictogram of putting it all together. And it, it, it looks at what ventricle or, or areas, so you got LV, RV, and lungs are involved, where the problem is, and where they overlap when you've got more than one of them. And then in each of those areas, it kind of puts where each device falls. The problem is when there are more than one option, it doesn't tell you anything about how to choose. And that's because we honestly don't know. The reality is, as I mentioned at the beginning, the pathology dictates choice, the timing or duration of shock dictates the choice, what you've got at your facility, what type of expertise you have, and what your exit strategy, if they, the ventricle doesn't recover, is, is available to the patient. All of those things factor in. And, and we don't have any correct answers there, nothing out there. So what has happened, as I said, there's been this stagnant, no progress in survival with cardiogenic shock until about three years ago, um, when really Inova probably as uh, the grandfather of this and others have followed suit is the development of a shock protocol, shock teams, shock um, protocol driven care. And Inova has published this and others have the NCSI registry um, that that was probably the biggest impact on cardiogenic shock survival. And so this is our device protocol. Um, every center who's done this has their own, with their own system colors and their own particular. No particular system is right or wrong. And I think that's very important. You just have to decide on something. Pick a protocol. It should be hemodynamically driven, as you see here under each ventricle, the hemodynamic parameters that should be present to justify mechanical support. And also, as you see up top, where it says refractory cardiogenic shock, and it says um, consult with a heart failure expert, look at the middle, it says patient candidate for TMCS. If they are not, okay, if there is no exit strategy for this patient, then that, you need to know when not to put in devices just as much as you know need to know when to put in devices. And I think that's a very important aspect of any system shock protocol. All right, moving to the evaluation process and what temporary mechanical support has done. Um, so the first thing is the indication for heart transplant has not really changed since the advent of heart transplant. Cardiogenic shock is there, but it's supposed to have been the smallest percentage of candidacy. It's now unfortunately become the largest potential um, and we'll talk about that. Poor cardiac output, refractory symptoms requiring inotropes. Once you're on inotropes, that should be an immediate referral for an evaluation. 
Um, for those who don't need inotropes, non-inotrope conditions, then it's metabolically, uh, metabolic testing based. Then the last three have really always been disadvantaged in the old system. The newer system has improved that, but it's still difficult, and that's refractory arrhythmias, angina, or the restrictive physiologies. Contraindications for heart transplant seem to be disappearing more and more as transplant centers seem to be on a race for who can transplant the most patients and still meet their 88 to 90 percent one year survival. And I think this is a problem in my field. The, the reality is we should be looking not at one year survival, but at 10 to 15 year survival. That's the average heart transplant survival now is 13 years. That's how we should be looking at candidates. Does this candidate, if their heart is replaced, still going to live 10 plus years with the rest of the body they got? And if the answer is no, then they shouldn't be considered for transplant, in my personal opinion. But these are the listed contraindications. So basically severe, 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 severe other organ problems that aren't going to be helped by a heart transplant. Then active infections, malignancies, or bleedings, that is stretched all the time now with bad complications and what malignancies can we get by with, like prostate cancer and skin cancers. The most controversial being ongoing substance abuse, smoking, or other psychosocial serious problems, mainly those things that would affect, affect their compliance to follow a very complicated regimen. So this is what an evaluation process looks like. And I hope by the end of this, you understand why we wanna see people earlier rather than once they're on three devices in an ICU. So the first is that an intake coordinator opens the referral, contacts the patient, gets records, gets an ins uh, insurance approval, does all of that background work that all the doctors hate. And we all poo poo and say, just get the patient here. But the reality is this is what needs to happen in today's environment. Then in our facility, we have a pre-heart coordinator who, who orders the appropriate test, gets things all set up for them, prepares the reports, et cetera. All transplant centers have a financial advisory department that goes through their insurance. The contracting with transplant is a mess. It has nothing to do with their medical coverage. So just saying they have X insurance has no relation to whether they'll have transplant coverage um, at all or transplant coverage with the center that they can be seen at medically. It's, it's a ridiculous system. And then somebody is trying to schedule and coordinate all this. So the things that are very particular to an evaluation is they all need a right heart and usually they're always done at the transplant center so that all the appropriate data is needed. All of this data is incredibly important now for the listing. We didn't have all these mandatory data elements before 2018, but we do now. So right heart cath is performed with um, opt, uh, what we call tailored therapy. And if they have not reached inotrope dependence yet, then a cardiopulmonary stress test. And so those two are particularly done at the transplant center. This is just a beginning list of all of the tests these patients have to go through. It's a ton of blood work. They always said, are you leaving any blood left for me when they see all the tubes being drawn? Um, an echo, EKG, left heart cath. Some of these things we can get from outside. Some are mandatorily having to be done um, at the transplant center, but it's a lot of work. Notice on the left-hand column, a lot of the stuff on the bottom is health maintenance. If we can see the patients early, it's amazing how many people do not have up-to-date health maintenance. If we can see them earlier in their disease and they can get all of that done in their community with their doctors, um, and then we don't have a crisis situation and go, he hasn't had a colonoscopy. I, you're now I need to do a colonoscopy on ECMO. The GI doctors look at us like we're crazy. They do it, but they don't like us for it. Um, but you have to know, do, does he have a colon cancer that nobody knows about? We find so many cancers in the evaluation process because people weren't keeping up with health maintenance. So other comorbidities we have to deal with is age. While most transplant centers will look at patients up to 65 and now even up to 70, there are some centers that will look at over 70 and the, it's not the, as we say, it's not the um, numbers, it's the physiology or what we call the protoplasm. What do they look like? Are they an old 70 or a young 70? Um, we have gone up to, we've done two at age 76 and one is doing great and the other had horrible complications and only live two years. So um, it's, it's carefully selected. 
Obesity is an issue. Um, these guidelines say that to avoid over BMI of 35, although increased mortality wasn't really shown until a BMI over 40. Our, side, our center, we're in Texas, we got big boys, um, will go up to a BMI of 40. Um, and then the cancers, as I mentioned, there are not all cancers need to be in remission for five years. So things like low grade prostate cancer, um, skin cancers, some other types that are easily curable, uh, uh, renal cancer, we found several renal cancers during evaluations, they get a nephrectomy and then six months or a year later, they're able to be considered. Um, so, you know, these are all relative comorbidities that the transplant center has to determine um, for the patient, individual patient. Diabetes is not a contraindication, it's how bad is it? I say how many opathies you have, the more you have, the less likely you're a candidate. And usually a hemoglobin A1C under eight, under seven, depending upon the center is what the goal for. And then renal dysfunction is an issue. If the GFR is under 30, then the recommendation is to consider for heart kidney, but how permanent, how recent was that kidney? Could we reverse it? Um, if they go into and get a heart alone and their kidneys go down, they've got a poor outcome. But there's a growing concern about the increase in heart kidneys and stealing kidneys from all of those dialysis patients waiting for years on the dialysis lifestyle. And so we're in the process of developing guidelines to figure out appropriateness for heart kidney. And then peripheral vascular disease, as I mentioned, um, it's how bad is it? Is it gonna affect wound healing, rehab? Um, if it's carotid disease, is it gonna affect their, their surgical risk? So it's very difficult to put particular numbers or data elements to these. It's a nuance. And maybe if they've got eh diabetes, but everything else is pristine. But if you've got eh diabetes and your creatinine's too, and you're, you got, you know, 50% lesions everywhere in your vasculature, you know, all of those relatives start to add up. And when does it become too concerning? So that there's not maybe one absolute, but a lot of relatives piling up on a patient. And then as I mentioned that whole protoplasm or eyeball test, if they're sent too late, we can't help them. Okay, you cannot get this kind of body habitus through a major surgery on immunosuppression. It isn't going to happen. And most likely you won't get them through a VAD either when they're, they're frail. So it's important to evaluate the patients earlier in the disease process before they get to this state, because it's just too late here. Cognitive impairment is a big one. How much of this is, they're just not as brisk as they used to be because of low flow. And how much of it is unmasking other neurocognitive issues? Are, is it early dementia? Is it prior effects of strokes? Um, and how much of that gets exacerbated when their heart failure gets worse? So having time to make sure and understand what their baseline cognitive ability is, is important because they ultimately have to follow a very complex regimen. And then when we get into the psychosocial, there's all of these aspects. There's their substances, there's their support system, their finances, their housing. You know, they have to be able to have a phone, have electricity, be able to afford medicines, get to and from appointments, be able to verbalize when there's a problem and get in. Because we're, we're giving a very precious resource. Somebody has donated a heart to this patient and we wanna make sure that they are good um, stewards of that gift. Here we go. Um, the next thing that's really come up and certainly in the COVID um, era even more so is um, appropriate vaccinations. We, I can't believe how many patients get to their 50s, 60s referred for transplant and aren't up to date on their vaccinations. And so we have to then suddenly load them up with, with a bunch of vaccines. We used to not be able to give them in the hospital and we would discharge them for their evaluation and then have to wait till they could get them somewhere. Now we're able to give a lot of them in the hospital um, because we can't give certain vaccines after transplant. So it's very important to make sure they're fully vaccinated. Another reason to see them early so that they can start getting all of that health maintenance stuff done. And nowadays with COVID, we're trying to get them COVID vaccinated before transplant if possible, because the Im immunologic response after transplant is not nearly as robust as recent literature is showing and it's what we expected. Beyond all that, they also have to see a plethora of strangers, okay? They're gonna be seen by a surgeon, a social worker, a dietitian, a palliative care 
um, usually a GI doctor, behavioral health, sometimes pulmonologist, um, coordinators galore. Um, it, it's, I always tell them an evaluation, you learn more about your body than you ever wanted to know, and you see more healthcare providers than you ever wanted to see. It is an overwhelming process for patients. In an outpatient semi-elective situation, imagine if you're ill in a hospital on a support device trying to go through all this. We also have to educate. We have to get them prepared. They have, we have mandatory orientation classes. Right now they're having to be done bedside um, or virtual if they're outpatient because of the COVID restrictions. Um, but there's so much for them to understand. You know, this isn't like going in and getting a cabbage. Your, your incision heals and you know, the surgeon in four weeks says, you look great, I'll never see you again. You are a lifelong patient of the transplant center and you have lifelong medicines that will alter your health trajectory. So it's very important that they go through all this. It's hard to educate them when they're intubated in the ICU. Then all of that information is digested by a selection committee and the selection committee's job is to evaluate all of the results of all of those evaluations and tests and determine are they gonna get maximal survival with appropriate cost burden and quality of life benefit that this individual patient is going to um, get a good uh, um, result from. And a lot of that is based upon some logistics that are with, not in their control at all. So with blood type, O blood type is disadvantaged. They can only get an O heart, so they're gonna wait longer. So the later we see an O patient, the less likely they're gonna survive to a transplant and often have to go to a VAD. Recipient size, the larger you are, the longer you wait. We need a donor that's big enough, that can provide a heart big enough to supply your, out, your cardiac output. Plus we have to battle any potential pulmonary hypertension that has developed from the heart failure. So weight loss, try, you know, if we can see them early and encourage weight loss, they get a, a better uh, chance. And then antibodies. So the multiparous females or people who've gotten transfusions can develop antibodies. The more antibodies you have, the less likely you're gonna find a successful donor match. And so the sooner we can get involved in their care and, and try and prevent unnecessary transfusions, understand what their antibody profile is and know whether transplant's even gonna be an option for them is incredibly important. Desensitization, which is treatments to try and reduce antibody burden, only reduces circulating antibodies. It never gets rid of the memory cell. So we still, even if we're able to desensitize them somewhat, we're still gonna take huge risk on the post-transplant side, because if you cross an antibody, that memory cell will reactivate and start developing more antibodies. And then of course, the allocation rules. We have rules with which we function in the transplant world. So in 2018, the statuses were expanded. Previously, it was divided into 1A and 1B, essentially. And essentially, everybody waited in 1A until they died or they finally got to the top and got an organ. Um, in my area of the country, we were mostly 1Bs because we were very aggressive early on with taking donors. But in centers that weren't, they their patients piled up in the 1A. So what the new statuses did is break up that log jam of 1A into 1, 2, and 3. So we wanted to try and get the sick patients who were dying on the wait list a chance at an organ. We wanted to more broadly share for those sickest of the sick. And we wanted to reduce the exception request because everybody was writing to the review boards, well, my patient is sicker than that patient and should be up at 1A and et cetera, et cetera. So we figured, okay, great, we'll stratify these categories in the 1A and we won't um, need so much of that, you know, please rank my patient. And that was started in 2018. So these are the statuses. Status one was the patients on ECMO, patients who had surgical non-dischargeable um, bivads or already had an LVAD but were having refractory VTVF. Status two was all of your other types of support devices, balloon pumps, impellas, um, a total artificial heart, long story behind why TH wasn't in one where I thought it should be. Um, uh, and uh, refractory VTVF in a native heart. Status three was all of the VAD complications, which is where they had already been in the old system, and um, patients on inotropes in the ICU with a SWAN. And status four was your outpatients, your outpatient VADs, your outpatient inotropes, 
And then all of those disenfranchised categories that I mentioned, the refractory angina, um, refra uh, restrictives and hypertrophs got bumped up into four. They were in six in the old, uh, in two uh, in the old, which was the equivalent to six here. And so this is what happened. So at, at this point, the pre and the post, you can see that there was a, a significant increase in ECMO, although total numbers, not huge, 100 more in the same time frame, but a huge explosion in balloon pumps, um, over 1,000 at the time of the listing. That's when you put the patient information on. You can see that LVADs, the durable devices, dropped from 77% to 58%. So less people with VADs were being listed. And then the, the others are small numbers. But if you look at this, what happens at transplant, over 1,739% of our transplants are now off a balloon pump, which to me is criminal. And you can quote me on that. Our LVAD patients at transplant have dropped from 78 to 46%. And our ECMO, yes, has gone from 1.7 to 7.6%, but at least a total number is still relatively small. But something we need to look at. This was what we wanted and this is what we got. We, we, uh, we mandated broader sharing so that you couldn't get all the benefit if your OPO was creating a lot of donors and, and somebody 100 miles away was, didn't have a good OPO. And so this has definitely happened. We're going further to get our organs, which means it's costing more. Costing more for the flights, costing, you have to pay two OPO fees. So transplant centers are spending more money with no increase in reimbursement to get the hearts. And because you're traveling a little further, our ischemic times are increased a little bit. And there is concern about this, that it that increases the post-transplant survival risk. So very big overview, because I wanted to have time for questions, um, but these are the takeaway points for you all. Shock is complicated, and there are a lot of factors that will drive how we treat them, what devices we use, and it's etiology, duration, and end organ injury, as well as all of those other intangible factors about um, exit strategies. Hemodynamic assessment is critical for decision making, and it should not be your favorite device. Uh, it should be what do the hemodynamics say will be the best support device for the patient. You want to support them as soon as possible before multisystem organ failure develops. Nothing is free. The more that you use, the more cost and risk you take. And there's no device that has proven to be superior in all aspects of shock. So master the ones that you have. Don't try and necessarily get every one. Formal processes is the way to go. It's the only treatment to have clear impact besides using a swan. Stick with the process, analyze your outcomes, and refine it over time. On the flip side, transplantation is incredibly complicated and evaluation takes time. The allocation system has produced a lot of changes. The hope was that it was supposed to guide us and de-glut the problem that was occurring in 1A. But what we've seen is now patients, temporary mechanical support is no longer being used as a tool to stabilize the patient and then move to a VAD. It's being used solely as a tool to get them to transplant um, and trying to skip a VAD. And there's strong debates, I was involved in one this morning on Twitter, um, as to whether that's right or wrong. Um, and the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Um, we have had a dramatic decrease in the waiting time for those sick patients, so they have a chance to live, but they should be those sickest of the sick. And it's already been demonstrated in literature that the only place that's going up in perk support is transplant centers. It's not like there's suddenly more cardiogenic shock out there. So only transplant centers are increasing the utilization of temporary support. Um, we are broader sharing. There's been no overall weightless mortality reduction in the total. There's been a decrease in those sicker ones with a slight increase in the less sick. So are we all just sort of meeting in the middle and what is that good or bad? There's been no significant difference in one-year patient survival. Lots of publications out there with early incomplete data implying there was but when you have all the complete data together, there has not been a difference in one year. The earlier you refer for transplant, the more likely your patient's gonna be a candidate, and I can't stress that enough. 